And so for many black activists, the bomb encapsulated all of the very things that they had consistently been fighting. Institutional racism, imperialism in an international sense, militarism, money, where the economic conversion, those things are all there. That's the voice of Dr. Vincent Intandi, professor of history and director of the Institute for Race Justice and Civic Engagement at Montgomery College in Tacoma Park, Maryland. He's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Tom Kalina. Welcome back to Press the Button. Before we get into the show today, just want to mention the passing of uh, former Secretary of State George Shultz, who died over the weekend um, after living 100 years. Uh, quite, quite a story, quite uh, an achieved life. And just want to point out the importance that he played um, in efforts to create a world without nuclear weapons. He was instrumental in President Reagan's efforts to move towards a nuclear free world uh, played a central role in how close they got to that uh, at the Reykjavik summit in 1986. And again, just want to appreciate George Saltz for a uh, long uh, storied career and um, and really making great contributions to arms control and national security. Agreed. And I hope others will, in addition to reading some of the really thoughtful um, obituaries in the papers today, I really in- enjoyed the Twitter stories that people had about their encounters with him. It sounds like he always made time for people um, and was very generous. Tom, we have a lot going on this week. What do you have lined up for early warning? Uh, Yes, indeed, Michelle. Today on early warning, we talk about the Iran nuclear deal, as we want to do, and clarify a misstatement by President Biden. And we'll also talk about a new national poll that shows broad public support for delaying a major new nuclear missile program. After that, I sit down with Dr. Vincent Ntandi, an associate professor of history at Montgomery College and the author of the 2015 book, African Americans Against the Bomb, Nuclear Weapons, Colonialism, and the Black Freedom Movement. We break down the linkages between nuclear disarmament and the civil rights movements, both historically and today, and explore how each movement reinforces the work of the other. As you all know, February is Black History Month, dedicated to honoring the contributions of African American and Black leaders around the world. Yes, this history is always with us, and this month is not intended to make it separate or siloed from the broader history of the United States, instead to uplift these contributions. As former President Obama said in 2016, it's about the lived shared experience of all African Americans, high and low, famous and obscure, and how those experiences have shaped and challenged and ultimately strengthened America. It's about taking an unvarnished look at the past so we can create a better future. It's a reminder of where we as a country have been so that we know where we need to go. After that, I answer a question on America's nuclear bomber force on this week's Q&A segment. And remember, if you want your question answered on the air, please tweet or DM us at press button pod. Or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. We would love to hear from you. And if you like what you hear, remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating. You are our ultimate promoters and the reason new people encounter this podcast. So we really appreciate it when you share it. But with that, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now... Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thank you, Dell. Last week, we saw major developments on the Iran nuclear deal and on the Air Force program to build a new land based ballistic missile or ICBM. And to help us understand the latest news, we have Matt Corda, who is a research associate with the Federation of American Scientists. And we have our own Mary Kaczynski, who is the Deputy Policy Director here at Plowshares Fund. Thank you so much to both of you for being here. Thank you, Tom. Thanks so much. 
Uh, Matt, let's start with you. Uh, as our listeners know, the Biden administration is under pressure to cancel plans to build a new nuclear ICBM, which experts say we don't need and is expected to cost uh, around $260 billion over its lifetime. You released a poll last week with some interesting results. Can you tell us what you found? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, as part of our um, ongoing research into the, the ground-based strategic deterrent over at FAS, um, my colleague Trisha White and I, we wanted to get a sense of the American public's thinking about ICBMs. And so, um, you know, we've come a long way um, since, you know, duck and cover era. And so today it kind of remains a little unclear how much people actually know about ICBMs, um, not to mention whether or not they support them. And so we thought it'd be really important to interrogate whether or not there's kind of a disconnect between the U.S. nuclear policy and public support for those same policies. And so with that in mind, we, we partnered up with our friends at Rethink Media, and together we crafted um, a really comprehensive national survey for the American public. And so what we found was really interesting, because as we kind of suspected, there was a significant and a bipartisan disconnect between U.S. nuclear policy and the public's feelings towards nuclear weapons, and specifically ICBMs. So the main question we were trying to answer in our survey was, what should we actually do about the ICBMs? Um, and so we wanted to give people kind of a voice into, into what was going to be a really significant budget priority um, over the next coming, coming years. So we asked that question about six times during the course of the survey as we kind of continuously introduced them to more information. And we gave them a whole bunch of options ranging from replacing the uh, existing ICBMs with brand new ones, which is basically the GBSD program, um, to instead just kind of life extending the current ones, uh, which Air Force officials have said is technologically feasible, um, to eliminating ICBMs entirely. And we found that a majority of respondents, about, about 60%, supported alternative options to the current GBSD program. And notably, only 19% of Democrats and 38% of Republicans actually supported GBSD. So that indicates that the program is relatively unsupported by the public on a bipartisan basis. And it, not only is it true that not only did uh, was did you find a lot of support for alternatives, but you also found support for delaying the program to explore those alternatives. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, during during our research, we kind of found that a lot of key decisions during the most crucial years of the program have been made without being able to access a lot of the information and analysis about the program itself, because for, for the most part, every chance that we've actually had to scrutinize the program, um, you know, Congress asking for an independent review, for example, um, those have usually been shot down, usually with the help of major uh, GBSD contractors. And so we wanted to ask people um, what they thought about potentially subjecting this program to a more substantial review. And it turns out that a bipartisan majority of Americans um, which was about uh, 64% support the idea of delaying GBSD while the program uh, undergoes a review. And notably, only about 18% of respondents were actually opposed to that, which really demonstrates that there's no real objections to subjecting the program to the scrutiny that it deserves. And uh, in fact, doing so would be widely supported. Great. And, and were there any other findings in the poll that you think are particularly pertinent? Yeah, something that um, that I thought was was really interesting was uh, some of our questions about um, safety. So, you know, we often hear that we need, you know, ever increasing number of nuclear weapons um, because of national security. But increasingly in progressive foreign policy circles, we're starting to see this shift away from a national security framework towards a more um, collective security framework because or sorry, collective safety framework because of its emphasis on you know, global security and, and solidarity. And so in our polling, we wanted to kind of see how closely intertwined those ideas of national security and collective safety really, really are. And so to do that, we asked people to rank what would contribute the most to their feelings of personal safety. And so not to national security, but to their personal safety from a list of policy options, which include um, a bunch of, you know, everyday safety priorities like combating COVID-19, um, lowering the crime rate, you know, combating domestic terrorism, um, strengthening the healthcare system, as well as more traditional national security priorities like um, increasing the Pentagon budget and modernizing the nuclear arsenal. And we found that on a bipartisan basis, 
those traditional national security priorities ranked at the absolute bottom of the list. Um, only about 5% of respondents, and that, that was you know 3% of Democrats and 6% of Republicans, selected nuclear modernization as something that would make them feel safer compared to the 43% that selected COVID response, for example. And so that sort of demonstrates that on a bipartisan basis, Americans are overwhelmingly not deriving their sense of security or safety from military investment, um, and especially from investments in nuclear weapons. And so that would suggest that reallocating a portion of the nuclear weapons budget, um, or the Pentagon budget more broadly, towards more you know, proximate security priorities would be broadly supported by the American public. Thank you. And uh, you know, we, we hope to be covering more on this poll in, in subsequent programs, but for if people want to find more, they can find it on your website. Is that right? Yep. yep. Excellent. Now, Mary, turning to you um, on Iran, tell us the latest, uh, what's going on with the administration's efforts to get back into the Iran nuclear deal, and particularly what President Biden uh, said recently and news about a uh, IMF loan. Yeah, so the big question right now, uh, both the U.S. and Iran have said that they want to get back to compliance with the nuclear deal. But the question is, who goes first? It's really a non-question. It's uh, been sort of hyped in the media as if this is a big, you know, a big debate that the two leaders are negotiating on the Sunday shows. That's not really how diplomacy works, right? They both said they want to get back into the JCPOA, you know, and the the hard work of diplomacy is sort of synchronizing those steps. I think all the signs are pointing to that happening, but there is a lot of drama on it because, you know, folks talk in the media and they, they kind of exaggerate the drama here. Uh, so in an interview this weekend, President Biden said on Face the Nation that the U.S. will not lift sanctions until Iran stops enriching uranium. Uh, he misspoke a little bit. The, the reporter asked a uh, framed the question in a very inaccurate way, implying that ceasing enrichment is a requirement under the JCPOA, which is in, it is in fact not. Uh, the administration later sort of clarified those remarks. So the question remains, you know, what specific sanctions does the US lift? What specifically does Iran do in exchange? Who goes first? Those questions remain. Negotiators, I'm sure, are working on it behind the scenes. So that's where we stand, not much, uh, not much has changed since last week, but again, the negotiating happens behind the closed doors. It doesn't really happen uh, in full view of the public. And on the IMF loan? So the big news this morning is that the IMF is processing a loan to Iran for $5 billion for humanitarian relief, specifically COVID um, and uh, humanitarian aid like that. Iran had made this request last year. It was blocked by the Trump administration. While the Biden administration has not publicly said that they have lifted the U.S. objection to this loan, the IMF's proceeding with the processing of this loan indicates that the Biden administration is sort of tacitly blessed the tacitly blessed the loan to Iran, and that is big news. Um, it's sort of a, it could be a face-saving way for JCPOA compliance to proceed because this is not the US lifting sanctions. It's an IMF loan, so it's not US money. Iran has to pay it back because it's a loan and the IMF is on the hook for making sure that you know the, the money is used in an appropriate way, the way that Iran says it's going to be used for humanitarian purposes. So this way Iran gets some economic relief without it being the US lifting sanctions but this has only been the first step. So this news came out today. We'll have to see you know, how Iran responds and what follows from here. Great. Uh, thank you very much. There is the siren. We're out of time. I want to thank you so much to both of you for being here. And I'm sure we'll talk again. Dr. Vincent Intandi is a professor of history and director of the Institute for Race, Justice, and Civic Engagement at Montgomery College in Tacoma Park, Maryland. Previously, he was director of research for American University's Nuclear Studies Institute, and his research focuses on the intersection of race and nuclear weapons, and he regularly works with organizations exploring ways to include more diverse voices in the nuclear disarmament movement. He is the author of the book, African Americans Against the Bomb, Nuclear Weapons, Colonialism, and the Black Freedom Movement, published in 2015. 
which was a huge addition to our understanding of the role nuclear weapons played in linking together the civil rights movement and foreign affairs. Vincent, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, and um, I really want to say that I appreciate and sincerely thank you, Michelle, for all the work that you do um, on this issue. Um, it is so needed and uh, so important. So I just want to thank you. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be on the show. Thank you so much. Let's get straight into it. You lay out in your book how connecting racial equality to nuclear disarmament and colonialism brought in the Black freedom struggle, specifically the modern civil rights movement, in your words. This was despite the very real pressures and costs that leaders in the movement faced from McCarthyism, from arrests and beatings that they took in continuing to work with peace groups. Can you tell us a little bit about why this was such an important issue for the Black freedom movement, even from the 1940s and 50s? Yeah, so... Before the 1940s and 50s, it's important to understand this was already an issue, um, already something that so many in the, the Black uh, community were fighting on. And of course, nothing's a monolith. It's not to say every person in the Black community was fighting on this issue. But in some of this, it uh, predates even the dropping of the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, in which when we had Japanese internment, there were many in the Black community that looked and said, here was a group of people that committed no crime, but were being interned and put in these camps because of what they look like and their their, their, their race, and this could happen to us, and identified with them. Uh, there were those like W.E. Du Bois, who's already lionized in, in Asia from traveling there. Um, there was the addition in 1935 when Italy invaded Ethiopia. It was the Japanese who publicly came out and said they were going to come to the aid of the, of the Ethiopian people. So a lot of this already resonated with the black community and immediately dropping the bombs for various reasons. Um, we had we had an initial reaction in, in protesting against the bomb. So when we get to the, the 40s and the 50s uh, with the with the Truman Doctrine, long before George W. Bush ever said it, it, it was Truman who put that line in the sand and said, you're either with us or against us. And so uh, to be anti-communism now fit every mold and no mold. And so, so much now fell into that umbrella and to be against nuclear weapons meant that you could be labeled as pro-communist. So one of the most dangerous things you could be was to be labeled black and red in the forties and fifties. But there were those that just didn't look at peace uh, as a bargaining chip or something that should be sacrificed. So while McCarthyism and HUAC and the House on american Activities Committee and, and there was so much uh, repression against uh, left-leaning groups, there were those like, W.E.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson. There were uh, those that said, we're going to keep fighting on this front because we see that we're now threatening to use nuclear weapons on again on people of color in Korea. And this is going to continue during the civil rights movement in the 60s, threatening to use nuclear weapons um, on Vietnam. And we also see this, of course, internationally with the French testing their first nuclear weapon in Africa. And so there were those in the black community, black activists that saw these connections. They saw it connected to liberation movements around the world. They saw it connected to their own struggle for human rights. They saw the money being spent on nuclear weapons and where it could be better spent in their community. Um, and they saw it as an overall issue of militarism, an overall system that had to be stopped regardless of the one individual that had the right to end life on the planet. So there were various reasons for individuals as to keep this going. And, uh, and we see that throughout you know, the 40s, 50s and 60s. So when you talk about seeing this whole system, did you see a reciprocal understanding or embrace from the disarmament movement, um, whether of equality, liberation or anti-racism? Did you see that in the historical record as you were crafting this book? It was a it was an internal fight that you often saw where you would have individuals in insane. Uh, you would have individuals in Women's Strike for Peace, Women's International League of Peace and Freedom that were avidly supporting and saying we need to connect these issues of race and nuclear weapons. But there were many, many others that said absolutely not. This should be a single issue. This is not an issue that we want to deal with race on. And so for a lot of these um individuals, these, these African-American individuals that were fighting on this, they had to deal with this internal racism. So for example, with Sane, 
Sane loved the fact that Dr. King was signing statements and advertisements and marching with them because of his name and because of what he stood for. And But at the same time, there were those that were in, you know, I would find internal letters going back and forth saying, is this a wise move for us? Uh, and Women's Strike for Peace in Detroit, I write about that there was a, a conference in which the Black members, uh, women members, wanted to have signs that said uh, desegregation or disintegration. And the white members said, absolutely not. And in many cases, it was people like Coretta Scott King that would have to be the go-betweens in these kind of things. Or even in the 1980s, uh, the group that I write about, Blacks Against Nukes, a simple Black husband and wife, uh, the husband was uh, a librarian at Georgetown, and they cared deeply about this issue in the 80s. And when they reached out to white groups, the white groups didn't, didn't say, now your, your community doesn't care about this. And so they didn't wait. They did it on their own. They created this group with you know a fax machine, a rotary telephone, and one flyer. And it became Blacks Against Nukes with multiple chapters. They spoke in Japan. They were featured in Black magazines. And, and that came about because when I was writing this book and then putting out some stuff publicly on, on other websites or, or, or um, journals, the, the, the gentleman, Greg Johnson, contacted me and said, I got to tell you about what we were doing in the 1980s. And so, um, so yeah, this was something that was not reciprocated. And, uh, and I think that we still have to grapple with today. I, I really love that story as you tell it in the book and just the, the way he describes the racism and the pushback, unfortunately, I found to be just very contemporary. Um, and these questions of, well, well, does it really matter to this community? They don't really, you know, care. The, the, the criticisms that you would hear from the white groups. I, I, we've unfortunately heard iterations of that even today. So I must say it was really startling to, to read it um, in, in black and white. Um, you know, in outlining the history of this, you, you make the argument that while the connections between the movements were damaged, um, they were not completely severed. And there are so many examples you give of the roles that African-American leaders, politicians, activists, academics, clergy played in reducing nuclear risks. But I think two stories stand out in particular to me. And I hope you'll bear with me as I uh, share them so we can better unpack this. One is the 1976 Continental Walk for Disarmament, led by the War Resisters League, that called for an end to the arms race, reduction of military spending, and shifting focus to rebuilding inner cities. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference, as you lay out, who the, there are activists who made the Southern leg of the walk in Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi experienced physical violence and imprisonment. The other story that stuck out to me was the role that the Congressional Black Caucus played, in particular with the leadership of Representative Dellums in the 1980s to deny initial funding to the MX missile and eventually reduce the number that were produced. So both stories to me represent this range of efforts and the levels of connections between the movements in this struggle for liberation and bringing an end to nuclear weapons. Why do you think this connection survived in such different forms? Specifically because of what it is about, meaning the bomb. So when I set out to do this, I wanted to put the bomb at the center and then pivot around it, looking at this black activism. And so when you look at African-American involvement in foreign affairs and whether it's wars or other issues, there is this kind of ebb and flow and there is this removal or things of that nature, focusing on other things, domestic issues. But what I found was when we focus specifically on nuclear issues in the bomb, it remains. And, and the reason it remains is in part because of the very issues from the very beginning, looking at it through the lens of just simply human rights and, and what is the point of, of getting social justice if we're all dead from nuclear war? The point of view of where the money is being spent, which is continuously there. Uh, the point of view of looking at who we are either threatening to use nuclear weapons on, who we did use nuclear weapons on, and who is affected by nuclear testing, uh, and again, with racism. And so for many Black activists, the bomb encapsulated all of the very things that they had consistently been fighting institutional racism, uh, imperialism in an international sense, militarism, money, where the economic conversion, those things are all there. And so that's why it remains uh, such, you know, throughout all this time, they stick with it. Uh, and that's where, again, we, we consistently see it even through the 1980s and beyond. So the book ends with an analysis of President Obama's legacy and the efforts he led to reduce nuclear threats and get rid of nuclear weapons. If you were to add an addendum 
What would you say the state of such connections are today? Yeah, writing about President Obama was the hardest part because, as you mentioned, it came out in 15, and so he was obviously still in office. So writing about, I knew I had to write about being the first Black president, um, but writing about somebody that hasn't finished yet, you don't know what can happen. And as a historian, the worst thing you want to do is predict something and be wrong, right? And it's in there forever. Um, so that was a tricky one. And if I had to add an addendum, um, I certainly would see how, you know, look at where he finished up. Um, but what I've always said about Obama, when there's criticism of him not doing enough on the nuclear front, I always say that he didn't say, yes, I can. He said, yes, we can. And so I would also add a piece that there was a lack of activism. And then if millions of us were in the street demanding action, that maybe we would have gotten it. Uh, and then, of course, I would have to add where we are at right now and, and the similarities of, you know, how white supremacy and threatening to use nuclear weapons of people of color, Iran, North Korea, and where money's being spent, all of these things obviously would come into play now and we'd have to look at where Black Lives Matter is and so on and so forth. One of the things I really appreciate about your work is um, you're a historian in the sense, from what I have observed, you, you take the lessons of yesterday and you bring it into the present and you apply it to work and to shaping our future, which is something I just really have deep respect for. With all of your background and your work on this, how do you see us, how should we be strengthening these ties? So, yeah, I'm not a historian that believes, I don't, I never understood studying the past if you're not going to apply it to now and how it affects us now. It makes no sense to me. And when we look especially at Black history, and we're obviously in Black History Month, um, we have to understand that for a long time, the history of the United States, the history in terms of black history, was written from a white male racist point of view. That was who was writing the books, and the textbooks, and putting out all these things. So we still have a lot of work to do in terms of looking at the narrative through the lens of African Americans and and what that and that that looks the, the story of America looks dramatically different, right? If you're pivoting and looking at it through a different lens. And so it wasn't until the 1960s uh, where you had African American students demanding that this history be taught from their point of view. We see the rise of even Chicano stuff studies, the Native American studies. So when I set about doing this, I, I still look at African American history as a giant brick wall, and we're still filling in the bricks. And for me, this was a big missing brick. And there's still so much work for future students to write about and to fill this in. Um, and so how do we take that and apply it to today? Well, the first thing is there one consistent thing that we saw during, during I saw was a connection, uh, whether we call it Pan-Africanism or this international connection where black activists and black students connected with what was happening in Ghana, what was happening in Ethiopia, what was happening in other parts of the world, Vietnam, Japan. And some of that is lacking today. And I say that from experience of my own students who are majority from all parts of the continent of Africa and African-American, how they do not identify with each other in many cases. They do not see each other in the same fight. And that was different back then. Um, and then you also, you know, there's, there's this idea, still a narrative that is that this issue is only a white middle class issue. And what I tried to show is that that's just not been the case. It's just not factually true. Um, you know, I heard, you know, when I started out this, this with this book and, and still here, well, the reason that there's Black Lives Matter is not involved in this is because they're trying to make sure they don't want to get killed on the way home from a police officer. They're trying to put food on the table, pay student loans, fight all of these. These were issues that were going on in our history, all these times that I write about, and yet they were still focused on this. So, um, the question is then why is it that we're just simply not quite frankly branding this movement in the right way? Um, a lot of my students just don't think it's cool, right? Just think it's a boring abstract issue. that's never going to happen, never going to change. It's a white issue. Um, is it something where we're not reaching out? The Congressional Black Caucus doesn't do nearly what it once did on this issue. They should be the leaders like they once were. Is it something we're not reaching out enough to um, black clergy um, like we once did? Uh, all of these things. Right. But it's it's and then it's also we have to, as you have been doing on the show and we've seen in articles with the bulletin, it is this reckoning of the national security and disarmament community with racism internally in these groups. So and of course, that leads into education and recruitment and what we're doing. So 
there's not one silver bullet, but there's a lot of room where we can look at history and, and kind of look in the mirror and say, okay, how can we combine these issues? In some ways, like climate change is dealt with, with environmental justice, what do we need to do now and show how this issue affects the Black community in so many ways and why they have so much skin in this game. What gives you hope right now? And where are you focused? So I will be honest that over the last couple of years, it has been difficult to find that hope um, as somebody that's dedicated most of my life to trying to eliminate racism and the bomb and then having a white supremacist with sole authority to launch nuclear weapons in the White House. Um, it, it was tough, but I made a promise long ago to the Habaksha, to atomic bomb survivors I've gotten to know so well over the years from all my trips to Japan that I would never stop fighting on this issue. Um, and so for me, what gives me hope is I have to say to myself that when I die, if there are fewer nuclear weapons on this world, in this world, if there's a little bit less racism than when I came into it, that's all I can do. And so when I see, of course, what has given me the most hope recently is that is the TPNW being put into force, uh, and especially seeing who did the heavy lifting on that, right, with the Global South. Um, but I see it in my students every day for that hour and 15 minutes I go into a class and lose myself and see what they're doing uh, in remarkable, unique times. Uh, when I see so many disarmament groups, when it just, you know, it takes for me sometimes just one tweet that I see from, from so many great young activists from beyond the bomb and on, and that gives me hope. So, um, I'm not naive, but at the same point, if you don't have hope, if you just say this is how it's going to be, then why even bother? And, you know, there were, I tell students, you know, when my students will sometimes say to me, well, nothing's changed, Prof. And I'll have to say to them that I understand it hasn't changed and it hasn't changed fast enough. But at the end of the day, they literally wouldn't be sitting in my class without um, what their ancestors did in the 1950s. Um, I look at South Africa dismantling their nuclear weapons program. I look at them ending apartheid. Are they perfect? Of course not. But I, you know, I, I just can't believe that these things can't be done. Um, so, you know, and I find hope in people that came before us. That's, you know, I find hope in, I tell my students, I wish I was their age. I wish I could open up the autobiography of Malcolm X for the first time. I wish I could read A Raisin in the Sun for the first time. All I can do now is pass it on to them. Um, but those, those people in the past that I study and that I admire, um, that also give me hope. Vincent, deep appreciation for everything that you do. I really hope your students get to hear this episode. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Welcome back to everybody's favorite nuclear Q&A segment. Are you ready for this, Tom? Bring it on, Michelle. This week's question comes from Mark in Florida. Mark asks, at the Super Bowl this weekend, they had a flyover with a B-52, a B-2, and a B-1 bomber, which I understand are capable of carrying nuclear bombs. Wouldn't that type of mission be outdated in an age of super fast hypersonic missiles and the like? Thanks, Michelle. And thanks, Mark, in Florida for your question. You know, the first thing that struck me watching the Super Bowl and watching that flyover was what is going on here? I just found it completely inappropriate to use the Super Bowl as a public relations stunt for strategic command. <laughs> I don't know whose idea that was, but uh, I hope they don't do it again because it doesn't make any sense to me. But just to clarify the question, uh, the B-1 bomber, one of the three that flew over is used to be nuclear certified, no longer is. So the B-2 and the B-52 are indeed uh, nuclear certified bombers. And look, I mean, they could have flown uh, all kinds of aircraft that had no role in nuclear weapons, but they chose our three long range bombers that either present or in the past had had nuclear roles. So this was clearly a, uh, to me, uh, uh, a nuclear message being sent to deter who I, I leave that up to you. I have, uh, I have no idea. Um, the questioner makes a point about hypersonic missiles um, and, and whether given hypersonics, we need other nuclear weapons. And I would just say this, this I think the, the questioner is buying into a lot of hype uh, about hypersonic weapons, uh, which are said to be faster and, and therefore more dangerous or more effective than typical ballistic missiles. It's actually not true. 
hypersonics are no faster than ballistic missiles, long range ballistic missiles we have in our arsenal today. Uh, yes, they are maneuverable, um, but that doesn't really provide any benefit. Uh, you know, no one can stop our ballistic missiles from attacking them, and we don't have a ballistic missile defense that can stop anyone else's ballistic missiles if launched in sufficient quantity. So the fact that hypersonics are maneuverable doesn't actually provide any advantage uh, over the existing ballistic missiles in our arsenal or Russia's arsenal uh, today. And the last thing I would say, um, yes, some parts of our nuclear arsenal are indeed outdated. It's not so much the bomber leg of the arsenal because, of course, uh, as listeners know, we have nuclear-armed bombers, we have nuclear-armed submarines, and we have nuclear-armed land-based ballistic missiles. And it's that last category that's outdated. Uh, they pose a risk of starting nuclear war by accident. Uh, we don't need them for deterrence, uh, and they are more of a liability than an asset. Um, so thanks for your question, uh, and um, you know, let's hope we don't see any more bomber flyers over the Super Bowl. Another week, another question. Thanks, Tom. And thanks, Mark. Remember, if you want your question answered on the air, shoot us a DM at press button pod on Twitter or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil, Zach Brown, Derek Sender, and Will Lowry. Sound design by Derek Zender. Audio engineering by Derek Zender and Will Lowry. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.